Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, today, it is my distinct honor to introduce uh, today's speaker, uh, Dr. Florian Huber, who will be speaking to us on career opportunities working as a data scientist. My name is Zeri Bengosu. I think it is important to emphasize that this is a really, really important subject matter uh, because in recent times, as we know, especially with the coronavirus, there, there has been now a huge interest in data science. A lot of people are actually you know, learning uh, data coding. People spent a lot of time at home during the pandemic. Um, and I realized that a lot of people spent time actually learning how they can do things with computational biology or computation, you know, and data science is definitely at the center of that. Uh, in Nigeria, in Africa, nowadays, we are also seeing a very rising uh, interest in genomics, you know, uh, big data analysis, and data science actually as is, is also at the very center of that. So let me just go on and um, introduce the uh, speaker, uh, as I also thank you uh, for really tuning in uh, for this seminar today. So we have a fantastic speaker uh, who actually has graciously accepted to uh, share his experience with us, but beyond that, he's also willing to uh, share his contacts so we can follow up with him on LinkedIn or Twitter and um, uh, you know, get additional advice or suggestion, especially for those of us who want to go in the direction of data science. So Florian Huber is from Austria and in Europe. So he did his bachelor's degree at the University of Vienna, where he studied biology, specialized in molecular biology and graduated with a distinction. Uh, he went to Imperial College London for his master's in molecular medicine, where he also finished with a distinction I spent a couple of time in the industry on internship, and then he moved on to Heidelberg at the Zentrum for Molecular Biology in Heidelberg, ZMBH, and where he did his PhD in Molecular and Cellular Biology, and actually also where we met because I was in the graduate school, but not necessarily in the, in the same uh, institute. Um, so we met at the uh, PhD time where he studied uh, molecular biology, as I mentioned, also graduated with Soma Kun Laude, the highest distinction uh, you can get as a PhD student uh, at the University of Heidelberg, or actually in PhD programs in Germany. It's a fantastic, fantastic level of consistency and achievement. And so we're very pleased to have somebody with this breadth of experience and credentials to speak to us today. Then he has gone on to do his postdoctoral research fellowship at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory uh, which is actually in Boxbeck, not too far away from where I actually lived in Heidelberg. Um, it's a fantastic place to do uh, molecular biology. This is, a, this is one of the best places to do molecular biology in the planet. Uh, I said some of these things also so that some of you can you know, search it up, look it up in, on Google. And you know, they have very fantastic PhD program. Uh, they have very fantastic postdoctoral recruitment program. Uh, you can look up uh, that as an opportunity as well to get in into um, uh, molecular biology. And actually, they, they do a lot of bioinformatics thing. They maintain uh, the Array Express, which is a very huge database that is uh, particularly collecting microarray, RNA-seq data, and other kind of big data uh, for different um, diseases. It's a fantastic, fantastic uh, place to do uh, research. And so he has really been uh, at the pinnacle of molecular biology. Now, his research is interests include you know genetics cellular biology data science and programming um he is currently working as a data scientist with agi uh, by agi uh, which which has uh, branches in frankfurt and germany but has a huge portfolio on many aspects of uh, molecular uh, biology and life sciences and pharmaceuticals and um you for those of you who watch football uh, maybe the german bundesliga uh, you may know Bayer Leverkusen, at least from what I see on Wikipedia, uh, this company owns Bayer Leverkusen. And, and to own a football club, if you are in the football realm, so you know that that's a big deal. So this is a re really big company uh, to uh, work in. And so he has actually transitioned uh, in, in his career in a very positive sense. And this is what I saw on LinkedIn. I said to myself, I really want to invite him to come and share with us his experience because I know he is not uh, a data scientist by training. You know, he I know he's a molecular biologist, and so I I wanted to hear from him. You know how he made that jump from you know molecular biology and from uh, postdoctoral research work 
in a molecular biology hub, you know, to a data science role in a pharmaceutical company. So I hope that we will learn from him in the course of his presentation, some of the things that he invested his time and effort on and, um, you know, prepared himself therefore uh, for this role that he now has. The one thing that I know is that he has been very active in many activities. Um, he has, you know, um, several papers in very high profile journals. Um, he is very active in teaching and um, mentorship and, you know, conference participation. One thing I should also mention is that even the hour that I do today, some of the fundamentals of R that I do today, uh, I learned from Florian. Florian was actually a teacher, a former teacher, uh, recruited by the graduate program at the time to teach us fundamentals of R, and we have to get credit for that. So uh, whereby you select um, data science or R or things like that as part of your elective, and then he, he was uh, the tutor for that. And I think that that is really uh, a testament to how much he has been involved in this subject matter. I mean, dating back to 2015, 2016. Uh, so that has been a level of consistency that would have um, given him a lot of room to learn more and have something to share with us today. So uh, he is a co-founder of this uh, EMBO uh, R. EMBO R is a kind of um, R coding club. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, Aaron, he has been very active in mentorship and um, also uh, teaching. So it is my distinct honor, ladies and gentlemen, to present to us this fantastic, fantastic speaker, a friend, a gentleman, uh, who actually I remember that we did also play football together with. So he has also, I should mention that, that he has not just spent his time on science and um, research and um, coding, he also has extracurricular activity uh, as well. So it is my distinct honor to present to you today's speaker. Florian Huber. Florian, please, the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Zeribe, for this very kind introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to share a bit my experiences, maybe inspire you a bit, answer questions. And uh, yeah, thanks again for, for organizing this. And I think I will now share my screen and let's get started with introduction. I will basically first talk a bit about data science in general and also basically give some advice, I would say, on how you can learn it well and what resources there are and kind of the mindset that is uh, good to bring. And then I will also talk a bit about basically, um, yeah, how I happen to become a data scientist to also give you basically uh, different perspectives on this really large field. Okay, so next slide, please. And yeah, so basically this is the overview of the talk, as I already said, like at first I will try to basically explain a bit what is data science, which people work in data science. If you're interested, how would you prepare for a career and then also where you can work. And then I will talk a bit about my career trajectory. And then I'm happy to discuss and answer questions. So basically, what is data science? I mean, there is always this generic answer, like the set of tools and processes to gain insights from data. I mean, gaining insights, I guess that's the more scientific um, definition. So in that case, I guess data science is, you could say, fairly old. At the end of the day, data science is when you do research, right? Like you want to record some data, you try to make sense of it. But I guess what is different today is that we have so much data, so like huge amounts of data that need to be analyzed with special tools where it's not so easy anymore to um, do the analysis, which you maybe in earlier times you could even do with a hand or with a pocket calculator. And I think the other thing that really changed is that it's not just about getting insights, it's also really about um, creating value, you could say. So if you think about all these IT companies, right, that have their recommendation engines, like if you have used Spotify or some stream, streaming service and they give you a recommendation for your next movie, I mean, this is all at the end of the day, it's like data science techniques, right? Like, or, or search engines, like they collect data and then they try to understand basically, okay, what do people like? And then that's basically like a value generation tool. And then the same is true for, I guess, many other areas in life, like even infrastructure, right? If you collect data on traffic or stuff, then this can be used to make things more efficient and so on and so on. Um, 
I mean, I'm giving here just two examples, I guess, whatever I give examples, it's very focused on biology and the pharmaceutical industry, because this is what I'm most familiar with. And here I also want to show already like the first example here. So that could be like a data science project where I'm actually currently working on. So um, it's at the moment, I'm actually doing some research in the so-called jump cell painting consortium. So if you look to the right here, you see cells stained, different parts of the cells are stained. And then we can treat those cells with different compounds. And then if the compound is maybe somehow toxic to the cell, or if it has some effect on the cell, it could be that the shape changes or something like that. And when you now record data for a lot of compounds, and then you look at the images, you, or the hope at least is that you start seeing patterns. So certain drugs that act on a specific part of the cell, they may lead to very characteristic changes, maybe the nucleus. So basically in the cell, maybe it changes its shape in a characteristic way. And that could tell you, okay, this drug is acting on this part of the cell. And now in earlier times, I guess you maybe did this for, I don't know, maybe a hundred drugs or a few hundred, and then you could kind of still manage to do this by hand, basically by looking at it yourself and working it out but now we are really talking about like huge amounts of data for example this consortium the idea is that across several research institutes and pharmaceutical companies they want to record the response of the cells to more than a hundred thousand drugs and there obviously you need now to have good statistics good image processing routines you have to ask where do you save the data you have to also ask what do you do with the data so i was saying drug mode of action could be one thing could also be used to maybe inform some subsequent experiments. So you can see basically it's this idea, you collect a lot of data and then this should kind of help the research process. Okay, so that's one example. Then next slide, please. Exactly here. And then a second example, I was basically mentioning already, a music streaming service has a database of its users along with information on which songs the users like. And by studying the association between disliked songs and finding out which users like similar music, it can improve its recommendation engine. And that's actually how Spotify works. I didn't actually know that, but they are using some very advanced techniques to basically compare which users are listening to similar music. And that's basically say they know that these two users li listen to similar music. And then one of them also likes a certain song that the other person hasn't heard yet then maybe it's recommended to them. That's just to give kind of an example from outside biology and also showing that it doesn't necessarily need to be like some research insight, but it can also be some sort of uh, where you use data to, to, to create some sort of business model, you could say. And now when you think about this now, basically for all of those things, you need to produce data, you need to collect it or collect it, like either you produce it yourself or collect it up there. Um, you need to kind of structure the data because real life data is often very messy, right? Like if you think about collecting data on uh, something in the population, maybe health data, it could be that often there is some information missing and that maybe it comes in different formats. So maybe you need to actually collect it, clean it. Dates are one example, right? Like for a human, a date is easy to understand, but you can write it in different ways in a computer. Like, do you first put year, then month, then day, or first year, then day, then month, or do you use some other special data storage format? And basically just trying to say here that data comes in a lot of different forms. And then if you have a lot of it, you kind of need to collect it and structure it. Then you want to analyze it, which often, it's on the one hand, it's something exploratory. So data visualization is often something where you don't even need so much math or so statistics, but by just looking at how data is distributed, you can try and ask to start making sense of it. And then another part, important part of data science is, so statistics is basically always asking like which data points are unusual basically, and where is it kind of different or which data points seem to be different from the rest. And then uh, there is also often this, uh, there is this term of machine learning, that's a very buzzword, I would say, but at the end of the day, the only thing that machine learning means is you are trying to use algorithms that 
um, can find patterns in data. So basically that can structure the data in a certain way. So for example, grouping similar users together, that could even be a machine learning technique, or it could be predicting something, right? So in the previous slide, we saw drug mode of action. So maybe a machine learning algorithm could predict if you now come with a new compound and again, you record these images, it could basically learn from the previous data and then predict, ah, okay, this drug is doing that. Or it could also predict how likely is this user going to be to like that song and so on. So basically machine learning is just whenever you want to predict something. And now when you look at this, basically each of these steps can be a task for a data scientist, I would say. Some people will be more collecting the data and bring it in in a good format, which is very important. Some people will be more dealing with the data collection. A lot of people are also really just visualization experts, which is also very important as humans, we are just very visual beings. Some people are more like statistics experts, but then other people are more maybe uh, mathematicians that develop new algorithms and that's their expertise. Other people don't actually care so much about developing the method, but they uh, want to apply it more and they are better at, for example, identifying some business question or some research question that where they are more like, ah, wouldn't it be great if we could improve this aspect or make this aspect of our business more efficient by using this data and to ask such a question, you don't actually need to know how to do it. You should maybe know a bit so that you can talk to the experts, but it's basically really always a very team effort and very interdisciplinary, I would say. So yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, and here, maybe I click just all the points here and then I will, exactly. So who is a data scientist? So as I said, basically anyone with the expertise to analyze and manage data using relevant te technologies or software, and you want to extract some kind of meaning. And yes, it's true, it can be a degree holder in any field of study. I mean, depending on where you come from, you will maybe focus on different aspects. So for example, I'm not a mathematician and I also didn't study statistics. So I'm not so much the guy that develops new algorithms. This is then really usually a bit more for the people from the quantitative scientists, but I try to understand what the methods do. And then I try to be able to use them with programming and then I try to basically find good ways to apply these different solutions that other people worked out to answer some biology questions, for example. And uh, just a quick word, there is often a confusing variety of terms, which is always a bit fluid. So um, you have to maybe take this with a grain of salt. So generally data scientists often does mean someone that is a bit more on the science or research side. So basically if you really find new ways to solve a problem, it's often not so well defined. It's basically you get data and then people ask you, oh, please now give me the best model to predict this. Or can you find the reason why our machines are failing? If you give you all this data, maybe you find something in this data. And so these people are often a bit more on the model building side. So for example, also the last two projects I did now at Bayer were basically trying to find out how well does a method work and what is the best way to solve a certain problem. Data analyst, that's also, in general, this in, sometimes is the idea that data analysts are a bit focused more on basically using and visualizing already existing data. It's often a bit more of like, I don't know, I think when you have a website, Google can give you all kinds of using usage statistics and then data analyst may look a bit more on the, just by the visualization and basically looking at the data and often maybe not using so advanced mathematical tools, maybe a bit more on the business side of things. Yeah, so that is then often referred to as a data analyst. Sometimes this just means that it's a bit more a junior position than a data scientist. But as I said, these terms are always a bit fluid. So um, it always depends a bit on the situation and who is using the term. An interesting title though, and I would say this is in a way separate is the so-called data engineer. So these are really people that make data accessible by processing them such that they can be accessed in a database or a data warehouse. So basically dealing with databases, maintaining databases, 
cleaning structuring data um, bringing them in a consistent format making sure that the database is backed up basically all this infrastructure work this is often referred to as a data engineer and this is a very important task actually because the data scientist needs basically good and robust solutions of where to get the data from and so that's i would say is these are the terms that you will come across and i would say this is more or less what we mean okay next slide please yeah and then actually yeah who is a data scientist um that's actually i think quite a nice uh, venn diagram so you have on the top left you have computer science so basically programming this is because we have just so much data to deal with so that's really i would say in these days it's really important to know a bit of coding and so now i'm talking about basically the what really is the qualifications of a data scientist then the other big circle is some maths and statistics doesn't mean that you have to be an expert if you're an expert then maybe you will be more developing methods but even if you just apply the methods you should still kind of know what they do and how they work maybe you don't need to know the details but you should know that a bit also some logic i think is always good to use your brain and then the third part is the so-called business or domain expertise so and then you can see for example if computer science and maths and statistics intersect then you have machine learning or if you have the intersection of computer science and the domain expertise then often this is traditional software so basically a lot of software is just processing data not necessarily with this classical data science background where the idea is always that you build some predictive models or that you find some correlations in the data if you combine math statistics and logic with business and domain expertise then that's often traditional research where data amounts were often small enough that you don't necessarily need a computer and then when you combine all those three things it's basically you would say okay that's a data scientist um but then let's not forget it's really about communication and personal skills you will always be working in a team and exactly so i'm putting here a unicorn in the middle because you can already see like wow okay coding you should have the domain knowledge and then also you should know some statistics and maths and machine learning maybe that's really a lot right and that's why i'm always saying finding someone who knows all these things very well that's like as rare as a unicorn even myself like i mean i would say i'm now a de decent coder i definitely have a good expertise in biology but maths and statistics i mean i have to admit there is it happens uh, fairly often that i don't actually follow 100 percent like if people send me some in the group i'm currently working on i have a lot of physics and maths people and they will sometimes share papers and then i have to say okay i'm sorry i don't really understand what is going on there can you explain it to me maybe in easier words and then sometimes i will also ask them can you implement a certain function for me because i'm not good enough at maths that like maybe i could try but then i would not be sure it's correct so that's what i'm saying with this unicorn i think it's fine to always have some gaps in one part or not being an expert in everything and but i would say the ideal data scientist would have all three of these circles okay next slide please yeah so exactly preparing for a data science career i think yeah i think you should be curious and you should think analytically like analyze data understand what this is trying to tell you um yeah you should have attention to detail i guess that's uh, important because you um sometimes the unusual data points can be the most interesting and you should also it's easy that your code works but maybe the answers are not correct and so you sometimes want to really double check everything to make sure that you're not coming up with wrong conclusions perseverance i think yeah data science can be frustrating but that's like any other job and to be honest i think programming in general you need to have uh, some frustration tolerance like i when i started programming i always thought ah, okay nothing is working but that's probably just because i don't know programming very well 
And I can just tell you, even though I know a lot more about programming these days, I still stuff breaks all the time. You just get basically faster at solving the problems and it's maybe other problems that come up, but it's normal that you have to work your way into stuff. And yeah, that's not always easy, but I would say as always, like if you at the end of the day enjoy it enough and if the rewards when it works is big enough then this will not keep you back strategic thinking i think this is sometimes overlooked a bit this aspect because when you hear people talk about data science uh, or when you basically yeah when you are basically the data scientists and talk to people they're like ah oh, that's great we could we could check this we could check that you could look at this in the data you could look at that in the data um, but then the thing is, even though with a computer, you could in principle ask any question to the data, your time and resources are limited. Like just because you can code everything, it doesn't mean you should code everything and you can analyze data forever, but then not every question is worth asking. So I think always keeping in mind what's the point, I think that's especially important in data science because it's kind of sometimes tempting to think, ah, oh, I just quickly check that. And then it's like just another afternoon, but you know, I mean, time is, I guess, the most precious thing we have. So always trying to stay focused and asking what is actually, is this going to be helpful? I mean, I've seen people improve some algorithm that then gets just 2% better and it took them like several months. And so I think that's maybe strategically not always good. So I think that's that's an important part. And then, yeah, ability to communicate and explain, because as I said, like you will probably not work on your own. And that's why it's important to be able to share your thoughts with others. So how to get started. So let's say you like data, maybe you're kind of interested in coding. You like to just kind of, uh, you would like to go in that direction. So how to get started. So I mean, I don't know how it is these days. When I started studying, there was definitely no course that was saying data science. I think it's changing a bit now. I think certain universities may be offering this already. Some of them are also offering stuff like scientific computing. But I think most people I've seen there, it's basically, I would say there are like two or three main directions. The first one, and that's not so uncommon actually, it's basically you start working in a domain and then you develop your data science skills later. I would say that's what was my route because I started with molecular biology and at the beginning I knew only experiments and until my PhD, I didn't know and really knew nothing about coding. But I already realized, okay, somehow people are now developing all these methods where they're gaining more and more data. Biology is becoming more and more data intensive. And that basically just forced me to learn some coding. I mean, not everyone then goes on to become a data scientist, but I also see now that a lot of biologists know at least a bit of coding. It's, it's a bit like physicists. There it has been like that for a long time because in physics, I think, working with a lot of data was more common for a long time already and there you see most physicists know a bit of programming at least so that's i would say the one direction and it's definitely not the worst one it can be a bit tough to then catch up with the maths aspects but having the domain knowledge is also very valuable and then you have the second direction so sometimes people start with a degree in computer science math physics statistics and then they find their domain later. I mean, this has the advantage that then they are usually quite good at the theoretical foundations, but then sometimes they are not the best experts in the domain knowledge. And for them, it may be a bit harder to define what is now an interesting question to answer. And the third direction is, yeah, you can just start learning data science skills even without a degree. I mean. I think the good thing about our times that we live in is that by using online courses and some resources on the web, you can in principle learn most of the stuff yourself. And then you can start asking, okay, now I would like to solve a certain problem. So basically that would be a bit like a hybrid of the first two things where you're like, okay, I think data science is cool. and 
oh, I would maybe be interested in this particular sector and then you can get started by self teaching so maybe that's also one thing to mention I guess from direction one and two it is definitely helpful I would say to have some sort of university degree but I guess it's also not always necessary so if you have the perseverance and discipline to teach yourself and maybe if you can somehow get your way into working on actual projects with like internships or maybe you write a blog or have a website where you analyze some data or maybe you do some freelancing then I guess you can also without a degree uh, get started but I think it's always in all of these cases the most important part is that at some point you try to really apply your knowledge I mean if you work at the university or if you have your degree then that's in a way nice because when you write your bachelor's thesis for example that is already like a project and then it's maybe not so difficult or then there's always the option to get some sort of internship and but then also if you don't have that like for example open source projects are an awesome opportunity right so the python programming language or our programming language they have certain um, packages that are used for data science and in principle everyone can contribute so you could say okay i want to improve a certain aspect of this open source project and then you can do this on a website called github and then people will see ah this guy worked on that project and then they can judge you by that so that's that's also an option yes and that's what i mean here it's basically really important to get your feet wet by working on real projects so but i think the good thing about our times is that by the internet and by working remotely there are i guess a lot of opportunities where you can basically offer some sort of service maybe it's just as as easy as or not easy but i mean i've talked to people that they just found someone who had some data and he just wanted to have some visualizations some dashboard to explore their data and then you can basically code this for them and that would be then a project and if you feel like you're not very experienced yet then maybe you can just uh, charge less or maybe do it as a part of an internship and so all of these things okay so then that's uh, i would say a bit more general overview my personal recommendation list for what you should learn i mean i wrote here five points so point one learn a programming language so there are the r and python languages and this can basically with these languages you can do everything choose one of them don't i mean maybe when you become more senior you can it would be good to know both but i think you will be busy enough with one of the languages so maybe choose one of them which one you choose yeah that depends a bit maybe on the company you want to work for or if your course colleagues are using one language more um also depends a bit on the sector i mean in biology r is quite popular also in finance and economics Python is in other areas, Python is more popular. I mean, that's um, both of them are good languages. I like R better. I think it's a bit easier to work with, but uh, both are good languages. Python definitely has a big advantage in the sense that it is more also like a general purpose language. R is really very focused on data visualization, data science, and statistics, and so on. And this is where it shines. But Python is more versatile. So, for example, with Python, you can also uh, run a web server, which I think with R, I don't know, I haven't tried, but I guess there is maybe not the best tool. There are other computational skills which are called Git and some Unix tools. So, actually, if you have some Linux system, that's always good because a lot of the coding is done by the command line. Then really learn the foundations of statistics. You don't need to be an expert, but I would say these two aspects, descriptive statistics and hypothesis testing. This is basically enabling you to describe data and it enables you to say, okay, if two groups of observations look different, could this just be by random chance or are they really very likely to be different? And this is basically this uh, basic statistic, which I think like just a foundational statistics course, I think is good and then machine learning i mean i would say get started with regression which works well with statistics if you don't know all these terms don't worry but if you say okay i want to learn data science you will come across them quite soon 
Decision trees, I think, are a good way to get started. They are not the most modern method, but they are actually fairly powerful and not so hard to understand. And then deep learning is a very hyped field, but it has also a lot of promises. So that's definitely also something that is worth uh, knowing, I would say. And then the nice thing about these programming languages is that if you know the programming language, you don't need to code everything from scratch. So for example, if you want to use a certain algorithm, it's not like you have to go to the research paper and implement every line of the algorithm yourself, but there will be some code that already did that for you. So often you don't actually need to do so much yourself. It's more like putting the different parts together. And then, yeah, find a way to apply your knowledge at the university in a job with an internship you could take part in an open source project and so open source are all pieces of software where the code is public and where everyone can modify them great great way to learn stuff and to connect with people you could even analyze some data yourself publish it on a website i mean i think people have done this with covid they collected health data and then some people put up a website with some visualization to, I don't know, track infection numbers or something. And if you do that yourself and you do a good job and then you share this on social media and people like it, then uh, it can easily happen that people will say, oh, that's cool. This person is doing this website. This is useful. And then you can also put this on your CV and say, ah, actually, I did this project. And yeah, talk to people and check job ads. Like I think that's also again, either in your surroundings or on social media. I think you always learn most from people. That's why I also think don't do everything remotely. I think it's still always nice to have some local community where you can exchange ideas and come up with, maybe people have recommendations what you wanna do next. For the programming language, how do you learn R and Python? I mean, there are a lot of resources. What is really a good starting point, if you can get hold of such a course, is the so-called Carpentries, which is like a non-profit organization that they organize workshops. And I guess that also in these times, some of them will be remote and they are operating worldwide. So if you go to the website of the Carpentries, check out if there is maybe some workshops nearby. There are online course platforms like DataCamp or Codecademy. I mean, they are not for free, but um, they are definitely good to get started. And then there are also, for example, free eBooks. So I shared here the R for Data Science or Advanced R book. I mean, if you Google stuff, you will find learning materials and that's basically for kind of getting to know the basics of the language and as i said before always try to also apply your knowledge even if it's just some toy data set that you find somewhere and there you can work on it could even be some course data or something a really good book for learning python i found it's a called so-called learning python book by mark lutz i mean it's in principle not free but i think you can find it online sometimes because it's already quite old and I don't know, I have the impression that it's kind of available. The websites of the programming languages themselves often have quite good tutorials. So if you Google R or Python, you will sometimes, or if you use a specific library of the language, then you will find some good tutorials there as well. And that's what I mean with Google is your friend. So if you Google your, don't Google your answer, I, I was actually should have written Google your question, then you often find a lot of help. So there is the Stack Overflow website, which will help you. And uh, so I think these are good resources to get started. The next slide, please. Then I mentioned Git and other Linux tools. Maybe that's not the first thing you want to learn, but GitHub is basically a website where a lot of code projects are hosted. So basically it's a, a repository for code. And um, then Git itself is a so-called version control system. Don't worry if that doesn't tell you anything now, but it's basically a way of organizing your code. And if you hear this term Git, I guess you will come across it. Check the pro Git free ebook. 
that's a really good resource because a lot of the explanations I found them a bit hard to follow, but this book is for free also online. That's that's great. So next slide, please. For learning the foundations of statistics and machine learning, I mean, for this, I tend to still recommend textbooks and Coursera actually. So Coursera is also an online course website. And I have found that Coursera, it's a bit more university oriented. A lot of the courses there are actually produced by universities. And I found them to be quite good in terms of the theory that they cover because this code camp and code academy and Udemy and Khan Academy, like there are a lot of online course websites, I have to say, when it comes to these more theoretical aspects where it's really about understanding a bit the theory behind the methods, I have found them often to be a bit superficial. And Coursera has some really great resources, especially if you're interested in deep learning. Coursera is, I've learned a lot from it. I can highly recommend it. Of course, if you have access to some university courses, that is even better. But as I said, it's, it's not the only option. And then I would say that's also something to always keep in mind. It's easy to feel a bit overwhelmed and to feel the pressure that you have to now learn everything at the same time in a very short period. But that's just not possible, I would say. So you will need to take your time for something. So. No one will learn these statistics things on a weekend. I mean, it's going to take you a few weeks or months, I would say rather say months. And for me, that was nice that in my PhD, I had a boss that was really a very generous guy in the sense that he would also give me the time to learn those skills. And in a job that may be a bit harder, I mean, I guess internships, tend to be a bit more relaxed maybe so it's always good if you don't have to follow a deadline too strictly because then you can take some time to just understand a bit better what you're doing even if it doesn't produce any results and it can even be a good idea to maybe take a break of a few months just to focus on these aspects and then use this more efficiently in a, in a job so yeah try to maybe stay focused and take your time for, for some of these things, it takes several years to become like a good data scientist, I would say. And then I'm now putting here on this slide just a couple of resources that I found very useful. So blog posts, websites are good. So there is a website called towardsdatascience.com has nice articles that often give a good overview of certain techniques. Twitter and LinkedIn are very good because people often share great resources about some learning tools or other programming tools. Blogs can be very good. It's often not so easy to find them, but if you Google long enough, you will, for each level of expertise, often find some sort of blog that explains it. I've also learned a ton from YouTube. There are really amazing teachers on YouTube that they can sometimes teach you something that is fairly complicated in a quite decent time frame. It's not always easy to find these resources, but if you keep looking, you will find them and it usually pays off. Also, a lot of lectures are on YouTube and actually I think a lot of universities also upload their lectures for free. So that's, that's one thing. I think actually YouTube is something I myself sometimes underestimate that it has really good videos sometimes. Then there is R bloggers, which is like a collection of blog posts on R. Yeah, one thing I also want to recommend is a so-called meetup. That's basically a website where, uh, so it's a platform and on meetup you can go and say, okay, I live in, I don't know, in Vienna, in Austria, for example, I'm interested in data science. Are there any meetups close by? And then if enough people are there, then sometimes there are like so-called meetups where people interested in a certain topic, they can then form a group. Let's say there was a Python meetup in Heidelberg for a while where I think every week or every two weeks, Python interested people met was like 10 people usually. And then they were basically discussing their coding projects, getting help from each other. And that's, I think, really a great networking opportunity. You may also want to join a data science conference or a symposium. So even if you cannot contribute too much, I think you it's it's especially if, if you can do this remote, maybe if it's too expensive to fly somewhere, 
but if you can make it there even better these are often good opportunities to get a bit of a feeling of what people actually do with data science so i was once in the in the us on the data science conference i wasn't actually contributing anything and i paid for it myself but it was a really great to just talk to the people who can ask them questions there are a lot of talks and you get a bit of a feel of what what people actually use uh, for real projects and then last but not least good old books i've always liked to learn from books especially for if it's a something you need to think your way into it a bit more research papers can be good and then also programming languages have documentation files and they may be a bit dry but they are often the best reference to really understand what is going on all right yeah potential areas of employment i mean i would say really basically everywhere i mean banks hospitals research labs accountancy firms insurance companies the pharmaceutical industry but also logistics infrastructure power grid companies uh, online shopping e-commerce yeah i guess in these days now that everything is becoming more digital it's really hard to find a sector where data does not matter like i've even talked to people who work in real estate because also there, if you have some data on which houses are being sold and bought in which areas, this can also help you to make a better decision. So approximate gross yearly salaries. Um, I can only talk about Europe and the US. So entry level, I would say in Europe, you're allowed around 60 to $70,000 per year. And in the US, 80 to $100,000 per year. Um, and in more senior positions in Europe, I guess you can get 100 to 150,000 and in the US 150 to 200,000. I mean, this sounds a lot and it is in a way. Um, but always consider that you need to deduct quite, first of all, living in Europe and, and the US can also, especially when you have these higher salaries, it's also often in areas where life is more expensive. And you need to deduct also quite a substantial fraction for tax and social insurance. But yeah, definitely it's a good paid, a well-paid sector. And also it's definitely true that in the US you make more money. And I would say that data science as a field is more, you have more opportunities in the US, I would say, because the US with all these internet companies has, has a very good environment for that. Um, but then as a European, I also always, like to say that in Europe, I guess you have a bit of a more relaxed life. Like if you find a data science position in Europe, like for example, in the US, you have two weeks of holidays, two weeks of paid holidays per year in, in Europe or in Germany, it's like six weeks. So maybe you make a bit less, but I think it's a bit, you have a bit more security, but then that's a personal matter of preference. Actually, I think also the UK is not a bad place for data science, um, but I don't know about the environment there too much yeah yeah maybe let's talk a bit about basically how it came for me so i did my bachelor's i finished my bachelor's in 2009 and i was actually more like interested in biology and and i only did experiments like i, I learned of course uh, i learned of course a lot about the theory like or basically what the biologists should know a lot of chemistry and so on but actually i didn't know a single line of code and I didn't know anything about data science. And even when I was doing my master's, it was still the same. But there, things then slowly started to change because I was seeing that so in biology, we often have the sequencing data, which is like a big amount of data. And in general, biology is very data intensive. But this is something that only started kind of in the 2000s or maybe late 90s there. It was slowly becoming clear that okay in biology we are now actually collecting more and more data new methods were developed that collected more data and and that was an interesting or it's still an interesting time because i guess traditionally people that studied biology they didn't actually learn any coding because in for the most time in the last several hundred years you could get by with a spreadsheet or like you didn't usually have very large amounts of data so it was kind of easy to manage it even like on paper but i would say in the 2000s the amount of data really exploded and that was also for me the point when i was like hmm that's interesting i, I kind of 
wanted to then answer questions where suddenly I had then like a lot of data and it was getting very difficult to process it by hand. And that's how I got actually for the first time interested in data science because I thought it, I mean, it became clear to me that this is kind of some tool that is probably very useful to know. And because of that, so I then did like a one year research project in Austria after the masters. And then I did my PhD in Heidelberg. And there I was facing a bit the situation like I knew already that I kind of like data analysis, I like programming, but I was still a bit scared of like going into a full bioinformatics computational biology project because it's not what I had actually studied. And so what I did is I looked for a project where I could basically do both. So I had really, a, was very lucky to find a PhD where I had like 50% was like doing experiments, 50% was analyzing data. So basically I chose a project that would produce a lot of data. But I also have to say, to be honest, I have met people that were in the same situation as me and they just did a 100% data analysis PhD in biology. And then they just learned it at the beginning of their PhD. I mean, I think I was maybe a bit too scared back then because it's it's something that is definitely an option to when you when you do that if, if you find the right position you can just basically also learn it there it's always the question who you find or which project you find so basically this was for me then the first time that i was really coding a lot and that's also how i got into teaching r because i got better at r and i thought at the same time teaching is also always a good idea because then you also learn yourself, not only the people you teach learn something, also you learn something. And then also one thing I really want to stress, a good university or also a good work environment will give you a lot of ideas. And personally, I know that it's a big trend at the moment to work remotely. It's also a big opportunity. And I wouldn't say remote work is bad, but I have to say when I look back about when did I get nice ideas or meet interesting people I feel like it's always good to if if the circumstances allow it try not to work 100% remotely although I mean it depends you can do that and maybe then if you go to some meetups or if you do some teaching then maybe you can still have a local network even if your job is remote but as I said like meeting people it's always important then I did my postdoc at EMBO, so a research institute in Heidelberg, where I was doing then really a full-time computational work. I was trying to predict drug mode of action using genetics data. And there I was then closing also my gaps in machine learning. And again, I was quite lucky to have someone, my boss did allow me the time to Sometimes I just spend several days in the library just to understand some of the methods. And I have to admit that I guess my project sometimes suffered from this, but I, at the same time, I really learned from that. And, but that's why I was saying like, either you are in this lucky situation where you can take your time on the job to learn something, but if you are not, then you can try to do some internship or come up with projects yourself or Maybe you just learn it on the job and maybe you start maybe with a kind of more junior position and you maybe work some extra hours and yeah, or, or you're just really good, very pragmatic at getting results fast. I also have to say that from my character, I'm sometimes a bit too, uh, I, I could sometimes be more pragmatic, I think, and I guess I could have sometimes been a bit faster. So um Basically, what I just want to say here is that because I didn't really learn anything of coding and data science in my bachelor's and master's, I kind of had to find the time to learn some of those things that I didn't learn in, in the studies. And I'm just trying to kind of give you ideas of how you do that. I mean, for me, it also involved in my PhD. There were definitely also a few, a, a certain period of time where I just, after work, I went to the library for two hours and read something a bit about coding and statistics. So 
um, just saying, try to think a bit outside of the box and, and yeah, hopefully we'll find opportunities. And then, so then I managed to uh, get a position at the Bayer AG in Germany. I mean, at the moment it's only limited to one year, but again, I think that just showed me that's a nice opportunity. I will try that. And there I have learned really a lot, a lot, a lot. What's nice about companies is that I think you have a bit more teamwork than in academia. And I guess I was also just really lucky with my team. And at the moment, it's not clear yet if, if I will get an extension there. But if not, then I think I will find a job somewhere else. Like we live in times where a lot of data is being produced. So um, I think there are a lot of opportunities. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, specific tools utilized in the context of pharma jobs and as a data scientist. So I already talked about Python and R. Now for R and Python, I wrote down some software libraries. They will maybe not tell you anything now, but I think when you use these slides later as a reference, then you, you can basically, if you want to know, okay, so what should I learn in R? What should I learn in Python? Go back to this slide and Google these terms, the SciPy stack or the Tidyverse. If you just Google this, you will come across interesting resources. Managing data, it's, um, yeah, typical tools utilized by data scientists is also a lot of data can, sometimes data is too much to be analyzed on your local laptop. And then for this, you often use so-called Linux tools to connect to some high performance workstations or the Amazon cloud, for example, or other cloud providers, or um, there are different options of basically sending your job somewhere else and, and you don't need to have a powerful computer at home. But I also have to say not all data science jobs involve these huge amounts of data. You can analyze fairly big data sets on your local laptop. It's just, of course, with certain data types, it may be harder. So if you analyze microscopy data, then you will soon get to your limits but if you analyze some data that doesn't need so much storage then you can also do this locally so what do i do at the moment so at the moment i'm predicting compound activity using computational chemistry so basically Bayer is a chemistry company they have a lot of compound activity and then you can basically analyze the chemical structure of the compounds and then i use so-called decision trees to predict the chemical activity of a compound. So basically what this means is that a decision tree is an algorithm where basically you start at the top and then the decision tree basically asks, okay, does your molecule contain a certain a nitrogen atom? And then if you say yes, then it says, ah, okay, does it also contain a ring structure? And then if you say yes, then it says, okay, ah, okay, does it also contain, I don't know, something else? And then based on these yes, no questions, it can say, okay, based on this, I think that your compound is, let's say, very active. And this is something that machine learning algorithms, you don't have to find these rules yourself, but the machine learning algorithms will do that for you. Then I'm also doing a lot of image processing at the moment, where it's basically trying to group the uh, shape changes of cells into certain categories to understand the mode of action. I also analyzed growth curves. Ooh, it's actually quite amazing how much you can learn from growth curves. Also drug resistance and how toxic drugs are to bacteria and also certain biochemical assays, genetics data. Often it was also just like collecting data and bringing it in a nice format. So these are basically the data that I have worked with. And then next slide, please. Yeah, so conclusion. Data scientists come from all different directions and you will always work in a team. Applying the skills is important. Find something to use them. I mean, also take your time to learn some theory. It's not like you can learn only by application, but if you never apply something, you will not remember things so well. Exactly, that's what I mean. Without some theoretical basis, you will not know which tools are the best. 
lifelong learning is really, I mean, we live in times where you constantly new things are being developed. It's easy to feel overwhelmed, but don't worry. You don't need to know everything and try to stay maybe a bit focused, say, okay, now I learned this, this, this. And then you will always, people will always come with suggestions what you could learn more. And then on Twitter, you will always see these people that constantly advertise some new method and what else you could now learn. And I think it's also in our modern noisy world important to sometimes just shut off those things and just focus a bit on, on what you want to learn now. And then I think one last word, which is important is, so if you're interested in data science and you feel like you have a good idea of how data can be used, but at the same time, you're like, ah, oh, it's not, it's not something I really want to do, like code all the time and, and all this math statistic stuff. I, it's not like really my cup of tea. Let me just tell you, like, not everyone in data science needs to be a technical expert. So maybe you're just good at understanding how data can be used to create value. Maybe you're just one of these people that are really good at providing ideas, at asking questions. Maybe you're not that good at really executing it, but maybe you have some good uh, ideas or maybe you're just a good communicator that can coordinate people maybe so basically you are maybe a bit more business savvy that's also a great option then maybe you should know a bit of the high level basically how things work in principle but not everyone working in data science needs to be a technical expert i mean the technical experts implement the solutions but which questions to ask this is something that you you don't need to to be a mathematician or a data or a, like a, this technical expert okay so i think that's it yes um yes uh, this is a really really uh, fantastic and insightful uh, presentation and i want to ask again um, start by um, thanking you for accepting to do this for us you know to share with us your perspective uh, to tell us, um, or you know, at least how you even moved uh, to getting into uh, the company, and really, I find I'm very fascinated by your frankness, you know, and your openness, and you know, discussing, even even talking about your contract uh, being for one year, possibility of um, extension or finding a job somewhere, and I think it tells a lot about who you are. You are, you know, you know what you are doing. You're confident. Uh, if it's a one-year contract, it's a one-year con contract. You have your stuff. You have a very solid background. You can always get any position anywhere, really, that you believe that you have the competence to compete for. So, and I have absolute confidence uh, in, in your ability to succeed, um, you know, there or elsewhere. So I think that I would like to just recap some of the key points that you made here that I think we resonate with our people. Um, you know, especially because not everybody is an expert in data science, right? And, and that's what one of the things we want to do here, we want to sort of inspire those who may be thinking about it just like you were thinking about it in 2010, 11, 12, uh, even with very minimal skill. Uh, so those who may be at that, at that phase now and who may be wondering whether there's a future for them in that space, that indeed it is possible. Uh, we have an evidence in front of us, somebody who have, uh, who has done it uh, so it is doable all you just have to do is develop the mindset and in that mindset um, there are a couple of things that you mentioned in your presentation that i think we need to bring up one is teamwork you have to be willing to work with people you have to be able to interact with them and try to see what you can extract from them and in, improve your competence perseverance Perseverance is one thing that I've personally seen in data science and data analysis. There are some days, I, I think I've told that to some of my friends, there are some days I spent a whole day, literally speaking, like I have maybe two hours or three hours of sleep. The rest of the day, I'm just in front of the computer. Why? Because I'm stuck. You know, I'm trying to fix something and I'm stuck in, in at a particular point and I'm Googling and I'm you know going to Stack Overflow and putting things together. Uh, it's, you know, I'm overwhelmed but I have to fix this problem. And I don't want to leave because I feel like if I leave, the effort that I have already made, my chain of thoughts that I have already built up to that point, I'm going to have to start all over again, right? And then there are some times that it helps to just switch off and then come back again, and then you are even able to uh, do better. But so the point, perseverance is critical. Thinking outside of the box, you know, uh, you know, looking at all possible options, using all resources, Google, YouTube, whatever, to try to solve the problem, 
that takes a bit of perseverance, that takes patience, and also takes attention to detail. And, and therefore, it is very important that we highlight that uh, these are critical skills. That you, these are even skills that you don't need a degree to, you know, to have. You know, if somebody is a patient person, uh, if somebody is attentive, you don't need a degree to have that. So you, you develop that and work with it. So the other point is also domain knowledge. I have found that domain knowledge can be very useful. You know, um, you know for example, I'm doing a lot of bioinformatics, but I'm just like you, I'm not, I'm not at their level anyway, but I'm not a bioinformatician. You know, I'm a molecular biologist and a biomedical scientist uh, by training. Uh, so, but there is something that I always think that I have that bioinformaticians don't have. So when I have a data in front of me, I always think that I can see the biology behind it. Or, you know, I can always, you know, somebody sends me a data to analyze, I know already, and they tell me to analyze, you know, they ask, tell me to ask 1,000 questions. Analyze this, analyze this, analyze it, analyze it. <laughs> you know, and I have like 1,000 things I could analyze. And I'm sitting down immediately and I ask them, okay, what is your hypothesis and what actually is your manuscript about? Then they tell me what the manuscript is about. And then I say to myself, okay, this is the kind of question that I, that is the most important to address what you are really trying to do. Because otherwise, I'm going to sit down and analyze these 1,000 things. And they don't know that each of these things is probably going to take me maybe 30 minutes for an hour. And then you add yeah. that together. Then you are saying that I should sit on the computer for one week. You know, yeah. Yeah, that's a very that good you're not point. going to use. It's a very good point. And that's something where you sometimes I find it funny. Like sometimes you see these people that are really good at maths and coding. And then they yeah. are like really good at applying or understanding some algorithms but then they find something that is kind of no one cares basically i mean that's maybe an exaggeration but it's really what you're saying that which questions to ask there you need to have the domain knowledge yes yes so you have to have that knowledge and i think you said something about that as well you know like um, when you when people spend time uh, because some of this some for those of this would it's this fun they can sit down for two weeks analyzing something just to make an improvement of two percent or three percent of what is already existing you know, and for you as a biologist, and uh, you, you know, you want to take what is already there and apply it and, you know, get an answer and go and do experiments because data analysis for us is just one part. We have to go back and do an experiment and confirm that what we are predicting or what we are seeing is true in biological context. So I think you make a lot of very interesting points in that direction. And so for those of us who may have domain knowledge, it is an asset. So in other words, if you are trained as a biologist, if you're trained as a chemist, if you're trained as a, you know, I don't know, a, a, somebody in public health, whichever the subject, and then you start learning data science, it, it is a huge asset because you have some certain fundamental knowledge and that if you then combine it with data analysis and data science, you're actually even more powerful uh, in terms of what you can offer. So that's something to take, um, to take, uh, uh, on board. I think at that point, I would just like to stop and, and let people ask questions now. Thank you very much again for your time, Florian.